In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Grace and peace be to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have seen a YouTube, which was forwarded to me. Questions, its title is Questions That No Christian Can Answer. Well, we are, I am not uh, a man who says, I am the one who has the answers, because I might not have some of the answers. But actually it's Christianity as such, either the Bible or the tradition that provide those answers. And sometimes the answers which we don't find in the Bible are not infallible because actually uh, they depend on our knowledge, on our research, on our capacities. Well, let us analyze uh, these 10 questions uh, which were actually thrown as a challenge by an American atheist <clears throat> and <clears throat> well here is a summary of those 10 questions addressed to Christians about the power of prayer, about God, about the Old Testament, about the Old Testament again, the slavery, also the Old Testament, bad, bad things which happen to good people. This is a, a, a general thing. So, if you want to see the objections or the questions, then actually only four of them, number seven, eight, nine, 10 actually can be and may be addressed to Christians. All the other six, so six out of ten questions should be addressed to believers in God in general, which means Christians, well, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and Particularly, let's say, to Jews, the questions about Old Testament passages, because, of course, we as Christians, we acknowledge the Old Testament, the Old Covenant books, as the first part of our Bible, but we do believe that the perfection of the law and of the inspiration and revelation is found in the New Testament covenant or in the New Testament. So, uh, let us deal with uh, the easiest questions. Question number two, if God cares, why do millions of people starve? It's, well, or many people, hundreds of thousands of people starve to death. And yet we say that God cares. Well, God does care. And it is exactly God's care which sends to those poor nations, groups, and individuals, believers, with their defects, of course, with their sins, with their vices. But in spite of all, these believers are the ones who are the ones who give relief. The, the popes, the other bishops, are always inviting the wealthy nations to help the, uh, the less wealthy, the poor ones. The church, well, the New Testament to start with, have always resisted against the mighty people of this earth who, who are eating 
the wealth of this earth. In other words, people do not starve because God does not care, but precisely, exactly, because people, especially those who are rich, those who are mighty, go against the commandments of God. So sometimes they steal the wealth and the goods and the food of the poor ones. Other times they simply kill other people. So they go against the commandments of God. Had they respected the commandments of God and the practice of the first Christians, which we, we read in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, chapter 2 and chapter 4, well, there would be no needy among us. Let us take the example of the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, the dime. Yeah. If people paid the dime to the, to the church, and then we would hardly have any people starving among us. Of course, this is a very, very quick uh, answer. Uh, now, uh, question number four. The world has been created. It looks like the Old Testament, book of Genesis, chapter 1, says, of course, in a popular way, that the world was created in six days. But we have two sorts of interpretation in the Jewish and in the Christian world. There is the literal interpretation of six days of 24 hours, but there is a more a scientific interpretation which actually sees in this process a literary genre uh, put in an artificial but very educational way in order to stress on the Sabbath, in order to explain why the rest of the Sabbath, because the word Shabbat in Hebrew means to rest. So it is a priestly document put in a popular way and also put in a mnemotechnic way so that people might remember it especially children. So, just briefly again, uh, in the church, we have two interpretations of such texts, especially of Genesis chapters 1 to 12. Chapter, uh, question number 8. Question number 8, someone says, Jesus never appeared to me. Well, it's, it's really demanding to ask Jesus Christ to appear to you. Especially when you don't believe. Especially when you challenge him. Well, sometimes actually he did in history, appearing to Saul, Paul of Tarsus. How do you explain the conversion of Paul of Tarsus? which is uh, actually uh, related in the books of the Acts of the Apostles. I come to a very, e a very easy issue, which is number 10, question number 10. Christianity is not good. Why is that? Because we have as many divorces, as many divorced Christians, as non-Christians. Well, actually, this, if we have as many divorcees in the Christian world proportionally as we have in the non-Christian world, this is not something wrong in Christianity. It's not something wrong in Jesus. In the New Covenant books, in the New Testament, in the tradition of the Church, it's something wrong in people. 
who go against the uh, the teachings of Jesus and the practice of the apostles. But allow me to talk about Christians in the Middle East. We are roughly 18 million Christians in the Middle East. I mean, I'm talking about Arab Christians because the Arab Christians of the Middle East are genuine citizens. They are actually the nucleus of the populations of the Middle East. I'm talking especially about the Arabic countries. Well, among us, and let me say that I'm proud to say it, we have the least proportion of divorce. I'm talking about Arab Christians in especially Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, etc. Even when a divorce takes place, <clears throat> the, the man who has uh, put this challenge doesn't make any difference, and I excuse him because he ignores it, as he does many other things, obviously, <clears throat> with all my respect. When you have a Christian divorce, it's, it's hardly in the church. I mean, you don't have divorce in the Catholic Church. So, when Catholics, and please get me right, when Catholics have a divorce, and Catholics are, are at least 65 million in the United States of America, something like at least uh, half a billion people, if not more, in Latin America, when they have divorce, it's never the church. So they never divorce as Catholics. They divorce as citizens. They get the divorce as citizens. From the church, the only thing they get is separation. Now, you might tell me separation is cruel. That's another question. But when Catholics divorce, it's not correct, not fair to say Catholics divorce because they never divorce as Catholics. How about the Orthodox Church? Well, the Orthodox faithful, as I said, in the Middle East, I'm talking about the Arab Orthodox, where they have much less divorce than, let's say, Muslims because they have much less marriage than Muslims. We, we don't have polygamy. So when you have less polygamy, you have less divorce. When you have, yeah, of course, when you have less, uh, it's just like that smart student who was asked, what's the, what's the cause of divorce? He said, marriage. <laughs> what's the cause of divorce? It's marriage. It's, as you would say, what's the cause of death? It's life, because you can die only when you are alive. Good. How about, let's say, our brothers in the Orthodox Church, when there is a divorce? There is a divorce only for some specific cases. That's all. So, now, is it true? Now, even when we have a divorce, let's say, in the Orthodox Church. The divorce is proclaimed by a court. But what do we have, let's say, in with non-Christians? With atheists, it's a civil court in our Middle East. For the Orthodox faithful, it is the competence of the church court. As for the Muslim world, it is important to know that we don't have the same idea of divorce. The divorce in the Orthodox Church, when it happens, for specific uh, reasons, 
is pronounced by the court. But in the Muslim world, you know that a divorce, for instance, every five minutes in Saudi Arabia among Muslim citizens, every five minutes, this is the average of divorce in Saudi Arabia. It's a man repudiating his wife or his wives. This is called talaq, tatliq. Or a woman repudiating herself from her husband when she has the immunity. al in Arabic. By the way, she is not repudiating her husband, but she is repudiating herself from her husband. Even if the popular formula is you are repudiated, said to the husband, in special cases, this form is not present in the Quran, to the best of my knowledge. But then also, women somehow, uh, not repudiating, but a woman, let's say, uprooting their husbands. This is the Arabic word, al-khala. A woman, a wife, uproots her husband, but then, of course, she needs the approval of the court, and this does not, oh, this also does not exist in the Quran. To the best of my knowledge, according to the Quran, which is not apparently the only source of legislation in Islam, but according to the Quran, it's only the husband who repudiates his wife or wives, his uh, uh, concubines, uh, yes, his concubine or concubines. In other words, I am confident, without claiming to be infallible, that there is much less divorce in the Christian milieu than in others. Let's say it more clearly with an additional element. Many people are officially Christians, yeah. They are nominal Christians. Well, they go to church once in a lifetime, once in a blue moon. So they, they have divorce, but Yes, their names are Christians, but as a matter of fact, they are not. So I hope that with these elements and with these uh, short, uh, short answers, uh, I hope to have uh, answered without any claim uh, of being exhaustive to, to these questions, reminding that six out of that only four out of 10 questions do concern us as Christians. Thanks, Achilla.